This time on Psychic Investigators. In small town Georgia, a man is murdered in his own bed. It was a violent crime. It touched the very core of this community. There are no witnesses and no murder weapon. We didn't have much of anything. But the family wants answers. He didn't deserve this. Our family was desperate. They call in psychic Phil Jordan. Can he find the killer among them? I realize it's a woman. She's horrified herself. She's doing it and amazed that she can do it. Thomaston, Georgia, about an hour's drive from Atlanta. An old mill town that's seen better days. A sleepy little community where doors are left unlocked. That is, until one late summer day in 2002. 8.30 in the morning, September 9th, a neighbor arrives at Thomas Bragg's front door. Bragg, a roofer, has recently broken his leg in a fall. His neighbor has offered to take Bragg on some errands. When no one answers, the neighbor steps inside. In the bedroom, he makes a disturbing discovery. When we arrived on the scene, Mr. Bragg was in the bed. He had the pillow over his face. Sergeant Tim Ledbetter is the lead investigator. He was tucked in the bed like somebody had placed him there. But who? The killer? This is murder. Ledbetter calls the Georgia Bureau of Investigation for help. Special Agent Vaughn Estes immediately rules out robbery as the motive. This doesn't look right. You've killed a man here in this room. You didn't take anything. You didn't disturb anything. Everything's still in its place. This is TGA Action News. Mike Kellerby reporting. A shocking discovery in Thomaston this morning. Police found the body of 46-year-old Thomas Bragg in his Fifth Avenue home. Police are asking anyone who has information about the case to call the Thomaston Police Department. Tom's daughter from a previous marriage is stunned by the news. My boss showed up and took me to my mother's house. Nobody would tell me anything. When I got to my mom's house, my mom told me what had happened to my dad. I was a daddy's girl. It was devastating. Tom would do anything for anybody. He, he loved people. He was kind. I mean, Tom would give you the shirt off his back. He didn't deserve this. Tom and his twin brother, Tim, ran a roofing company in Thomaston. Everyone knows them. This case was a violent crime, and it touched the very core of this community. Everyone wanted closure to this case. And they wanted answers. Someone walked right in the front door, killed a man in the bed, and walked right back out the front door, and no one could believe that that could happen in Thomaston. It's a quiet, sleepy little town. But there was nothing quiet about Tom's marriage. His wife, Mary Ann, had been meeting men on the internet. Tim had been there earlier that day, and he said that they were um, fighting. My dad, he was pretty upset with the relationships that she had on the computer. But they had always uh, fussed and fought. They, they had never gotten along. So this was nothing new to me. I told Tim Ledbetter that Mary Ann did not kill Tom but I knew there was someone out there who did. Anytime you have a husband killed in the marital home, the spouse is gonna be one of your top suspects. When Marianne Bragg arrives home, she's informed of Tom's murder and taken in for questioning. We took her into interview custody, towed her vehicle to check it out for any blood, any fibers. But during that interview, something disturbing emerges. Marianne is not acting like the grieving wife. 
There was no concern. There was no talk of the funeral. There was no talk of who killed my husband. There was no talk of anything emotional. It was very cold. During the interview, I was not getting the impression that she was a grieving widow. I was getting the impression that she was, had just been happily divorced. The clothes that she had on was sent to the crime lab. Despite Marianne's unusual behavior, police have little to go on. Her vehicle and clothes come back from the lab, and they're clean. Even her alibi checks out. She was in LaGrange, 30 miles away at her psychiatrist's. There is no hard evidence to tie Marianne Bragg to her husband's death. Weeks go by. Tom's friends, family members, co-workers, and neighbors are interviewed and re-interviewed. But nothing. With no new information, the case is going nowhere fast. There was always that hope that something new would turn up, a little bit of information that could be the glue to put a lot of puzzle pieces together. Weeks turn to months, then years. The investigation goes stone cold. Two years after the homicide, we still didn't have much of anything. I was more or less at my wit's end. You want to bring closure for these people, and when you know beyond any shadow of a doubt in your mind, you know who did it, you know why they did it, but when you move from that into the trial, you have to have something substantial. And that's where we were not at. You may get one bite of the apple and miss. We called the police department every week, but after so long, you kind of grow used to, you know, not having hope. I felt like Tom's murder will never be solved. I have got to find someone to help with this case. And then one night, she does. Tom's sister sees a television program about Phil Jordan, a psychic who has helped police on hundreds of unsolved cases. A psychic had never crossed my mind in my life. You hear so many horror stories about psychics, um, but we were desperate. When Linda calls Jordan at his home in upstate New York, all he asks for is a photo of the victim. No other information. When I work a police case, I take a picture of the person involved in the case, and I look at that picture and mentally perceive them as if it's like an intense daydream or a video going on in my head. Sometimes it moves rather slowly, but most of the time it moves very, very rapidly. It's very much like I'm walking with that person. December 2004, Phil Jordan and Linda Hunt talk over the phone. Phil records the session. What he says next could reignite the case, but will the police listen? Some sort of a blunt instrument, but having a sharp edge on one side of it. Thomaston, Georgia, a man is bludgeoned to death in his own bed. After two years, the case is cold. Desperate for answers, the family contacts psychic Phil Jordan, who immediately zeroes in on the murder weapon. Some sort of a blunt instrument, but having a sharp edge on one side of it. There's going to be a white one-story building. Maybe it would have been doctor's offices or something of that nature. And it feels like there's got to be a man connected with that that somehow has knowledge of or was involved in the commission of the crime. A white building. A blunt object. What does it mean? When I hung up that phone, I was on cloud nine. I knew we were fixing to get some help with Tom's murder. Thomas was a twin, and I can't perceive anything like that happening to my twin or a sibling and having it be unresolved. So I felt for Linda's sake, as well as for Thomas's sake, I had to do what I could to help resolve this case. But will the police take the word of a psychic seriously? I wasn't comfortable talking with Phil. I was always 
taught the scientific way of doing a case. You know, going for the evidence, going for the fibers, going for the fingerprints. Someone that saw something that didn't see something, uh, I never believed. But we heard several uh, things that nobody else would have known about the case except for the ones that were working the case. We still felt that Marianne was the key suspect, but still in 2004, we did not have the proper evidence to convict her, but we were still hopeful. Although skeptical, the police have nothing to lose. They decide to bring Jordan to Thomaston. First place we went to was the location of the murder. Uh, no one had lived there since the murder. We allowed Phil to be on his own. Uh, we let him guide us. You immediately begin to feel the morbidity, the darkness of what happened there. My psychic self takes over, and I walk through the house as if the house is furnished, as if people are living there, as if I'm with them on the day and time that the crime took place. He kept seeing dollar signs. He mentioned that the reason that Thomas was killed was uh, a good possibility that the motive was for money. When Phil, he was giving us the impression of what he saw, he didn't know that we knew about the insurance policy. Uh, we didn't tell him that we knew about the insurance policy. The police know that Mary Ann took out a $25,000 life insurance policy seven months before Tom's death. But that on its own isn't enough to build a case. And to the left, there's a room that's intriguing to me, um, psychically intriguing. There's something about that room. So I go in and I stand in the middle of the room and I, I realize this is where this man died. He ended up taking us into the room where the murder had occurred without us even telling him where it was. He was able to tell us where the bed was laying, how Thomas was laying in the bed that nobody else knew about. It, it kind of hit home. It really did. Now the psychic seems to be channeling the victim. Suddenly, I, I'm hit in the head. I can't move. This is somebody I knew, somebody that I loved. Why are they doing this to me? Even more chilling. Now he becomes the killer. I realize it's a woman. She's horrified herself she's doing it and amazed that she can do it. <laughs> How the person was swinging the item. He gave us the picture of a hammer, where she might have stood. Nobody knew at the time other than us. Suddenly, I have this feeling that I've got to go to a different location. I leave the room, tell the detectives we've got to get in the car, and I will direct you to where we have to go. He wanted to get in the car and drive. He said he had a, a strong feeling that he needed to take us somewhere. I just wait and see why I'm going, 
where I'm going. He'd never been here before in his life, didn't know the town, didn't know the streets. He told me to start turning uh, at certain roads. Now we have to go two blocks. We'll turn left. I say we have to go to the end of the street. turn right. We turn into a driveway, and I guess this is when I get cold chills, just thinking about looking back over it at the same time I was getting cold chills then. There's something about that apartment that is connected to this crime. In Thomaston, Georgia, psychic investigator Phil Jordan is helping the police find the killer of Thomas Bragg. Jordan leads them to a house. But why this one? We turned into a driveway, which was an apartment complex. We pulled right in front of Mary Ann Bragg's front door, where Mary Ann Bragg was living at this time. How? And I tell them the second apartment from the end is psychically intriguing to me. There's something about that apartment that is connected to this crime. And there is no doubt in my mind. That was just amazing. Without being told anything, Jordan has taken the cops straight to their original prime suspect's new home. They are convinced now, more than ever, that Marianne Bragg killed her husband. Before leaving Thomaston, Jordan offers the police more intriguing psychic clues. I sense copper. Louisiana. Texas. When I left Georgia, they said, this case is going to end in conviction. And I knew that it would be resolved. Then, a few weeks later, the cryptic clues, copper, Louisiana, and Texas become clear when an anonymous phone tip leads the police to Marianne's best friend. And her name was Penny Carter. So we thought, hmm, Copper, Penny. And when we started looking for Miss Carter, she was no longer in Georgia. When they first interviewed Penny after the murder, she said nothing. Now, guided by Phil Jordan, the police track her down in Beaumont, right on the Texas-Louisiana border. Phil was on the track again. We were probably less than 30 miles from the Louisiana border and on the other side of Texas where we located her. We took her to one of the local uh, police departments uh, where we sat down and interviewed her. She drops a bombshell. Penny had been told by Mary Ann not on one occasion, but two occasions, that she had killed Thomas. Phil Jordan's extraordinary insights and Penny Carter's explosive new information reignite the case. Take everyone's case file, everyone's interview, and categorize everything and get everything in a workable order, and then see what you have. Investigators re-examine Marianne's alibi for the time of the murder a psychiatric appointment in LaGrange. Marianne's psychiatrist has steadfastly refused to break doctor-patient confidentiality. White, one-story building, maybe would have been doctor's offices. Got to be a man connected with that that somehow has knowledge of the crime. But could the psychic be right? Does the key to this case lie in his session notes with Marianne on the morning of the murder? We were able to get the judge to issue the search warrant. We thought the uh, information that was involved was more important than the patient confidentiality. And we were right. That was a pivotal piece of information. She's reporting to her psychiatrist, my husband's dead, before the body's been discovered. 
I thought she was telling me the truth, and I believed her for a long time. Mary Ann Bragg is arrested on November 7th, 2005. Ten months later, the trial begins. Ms. Bragg, did you kill your husband? No, sir. The prosecution argues that Mary Ann Bragg struck her husband repeatedly on the left side of the head with a blunt instrument, covered his head with a pillow, and left for her doctor's appointment in LaGrange. As the trial unfolds, it becomes clear that Phil Jordan's visions were dead on. First, the cryptic connection to Copper when Penny Carter tells the court what Mary Ann told her. What would you do or say if I killed Tom? Did you go to the police? No, I didn't. I was scared. Then, the doctor's notes from the morning of Tom Bragg's murder. Did Mary Ann Bragg see Dr. Andrews that day? The notes say that she did. Heath English is the assistant district attorney. The doctor's log indicated when he met with Mary Ann, she was quite upset. The reason for her state that morning was that her husband had been found dead. At that point in time, no one had contacted Mary Ann Bragg. And finally, the motive. The main motive in this particular case was money. After a four-day trial, Mary Ann Bragg is found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Her lawyers immediately file an appeal. When talking to people and they ask me who is the most cold and diabolical and ruthless person I've ever encountered, I say the name Mary Ann Bragg. Without the visions of psychic Phil Jordan, the evidence leading to her conviction may never have been found. How did he see what no one else could? I think many times people's skepticism allows them to close a door that they may uh, have wished could have been left open. Her statements to Penny, the statements made to the doctor, helped bring everything together. And without those two, to this day, I don't think you have a complete picture. Dylan would feel throughout this case, uh, it opened my mind to, to think more outside the box. Bill Jordan, with the help of the detectives, I give all the credit to. Bill Jordan is my hero.